Good evening. I think we'd like to get started. My name is Chris McLaughlin, and I'm on the board of the Wilkes-Barre Area League of Women Voters, and I'd like to thank everybody for coming out this evening, and I'd certainly like to thank our candidates for coming, and also Wyoming Seminary for offering us this forum. Um, I'd just like to give you a little background of how this forum is going to be. Um, tonight's forum is a forum and not a debate. So our intent tonight is to get to the issues and not to get into bantering back and forth. So we'll, I'm going to try to be luckier than the people that were doing the Republican c debate were last night. So <laughs> we're going to ask the candidates to try to stick to the issues as much as possible. We would appreciate that. What we're going to do is we're going to have each candidate give a one and a half minute introduction. And then we have lots of questions. And thank you all. We've got many, many questions. So I think I'm going to cut off the questions now because we've got, I'm sorry? Uh, no, we're, we're, that's not, we're not going to do that tonight. It's just, we're just going to try to get, get some information. Thank you. Um, so we're each going to do a minute introduction and then we're going to alternate the questions. And at the end, the candidates will have an opportunity to close up. And at that point, they, they will have the opportunity to address any issues the other candidate may have raised. So without further ado, we'd like to ask, oh, and we do have timers. Where are our timers? Right there. OK, so we're going to ask you to keep to the time. Um, so without further ado, we're going to ask Mr. DeLuca to start. Okay. Thank you. Um, first of all, I was uh, planning to use my minute and a half to run down my resume, uh, but uh, Stephanie was kind enough to, uh, to uh, send that to most of your homes. Uh, I know most of you got uh, a flyer in the mail that in, uh, listed a number of cases that I've handled over the years. It's no secret, and I haven't hit it uh, from the beginning of this campaign, that I've been a defense lawyer for my entire career. Um, I was a public defender for 15 years part-time. Uh, I, I served in that office along with Joe Saperito, who's a, a federal magistrate now, uh, and Judge Joe Sklorowski, who's a Luzerne County Court of Common Pleas judge. Uh, neither of those individuals had any prosecution experience either, uh, but they were still uh, served in that office. And I could tell you this, who would have thought that after four years, facing a, an incumbent that's been in office for four years, that I'd be able to sit here and say, uh, that I've prosecuted as many cases as she has. Zero. And the reality is, uh, I've tried over 50 jury trials. Uh, I'm, a I'm a criminal trial specialist certified uh, by the National Board of Trial Advocacy. Uh, I guess you'd ask the question, what are your ads implying? Are your ads implying that I am, that somehow there's a criminal virus that, uh, that uh, rubs off on you if you represent criminal defendants? I think that's ridiculous, and I think anyone that has practice, practiced criminal law uh, would tell you uh, that that's ridiculous. Thank you. Ms. Salavantis? I am Stephanie Salavantis, the district attorney here for Luzerne County. And I, tonight, am going to talk to you about the office, our accomplishments, and our goals as we move forward. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for putting on this, this forum as well as Attorney McLaughlin for being the moderator here tonight and thank all of you for being in participation here tonight during this forum. And lastly, I would like to thank my opponent, Mr. DeLuca, for agreeing to a positive discussion about the issues that face the office and our county. I have made it a priority to prosecute and investigate those who victimize our communities. I reorganized the office so that it operates more efficiently and effectively, using specialized training of our prosecutors and our detectives and put it to better use. We did all of this and were able to secure convictions daily for drug offenses and violent crime. And we have a 100% criminal homicide conviction rate, which includes convicting Hugo Solinsky, who now serves two life sentences. I created a gang intelligence unit to better combat drugs and gangs in our community and have been proactive to help protect our seniors and children. I have built a relationship with law enforcement and I am proud of, to be endorsed by them. Thank you. This first question will be for you. What do you see as the biggest challenge if you are elected, or in your case, re-elected? 
I think the biggest challenge that we face every day in the district attorney's office and throughout our community are the continued, um, the continued issues of crime on our streets and the increase, or I should say, the decrease in our budgets every year, statewide, countywide, nationwide. That is our biggest challenge. We need to be able to provide resources to our law enforcement in order to cut down on the crime that is taking place. That is people, that is your number one concern and the number one concern I hear every day when I talk to the community. We need to be able to fund our office and fund law enforcement so that they can work on the streets to protect you, to protect the residents of Luzerne County. Thank you. Mr. DeLuca? Well, uh, I believe violent crime uh, is, is the largest problem that's facing uh, Luzerne County right now. Um, and the reality is that over the past number of years and past number of administrations, we've done nothing to address it uh, that's worked. Um, some, we don't, you don't have to be a, a genius to look to the other areas where they've been able to uh, reduce violent crime uh, through innovative, proactive, uh, community-based prosecution. Uh, they've implemented programs that have actually reduced the rate of violent crime. On a national average, violent crime is on the decrease. Uh, in our area, uh, I just woke up and, and again, as I've done so many times over the past four years, woke up to another uh, shooting. Uh, violent crime, obviously, in Luzerne County is not on the reduction. The approach is different than we've seen, and the approach that I plan to take uh, is based on really three principles. It's based on arresting, prosecuting, and convicting and jailing violent offenders. It's also based on keeping nonviolent offenders from becoming violent. And that includes expansion of programs like specialty court uh, and allowing uh, defendants who are nonviolent the opportunity to remain nonviolent. And it also uh, is based on a third principle, which is keeping non-offenders from becoming offenders in the first place. Uh, and that includes kids. That includes uh, instituting programs in our schools to reduce truancy. Uh, it includes uh, educational programs for kids. Thank you. And the next question will be for you. How would you save money within the office if elected or re-elected? I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, and I'll tell you during my closing if I have any time left, um, I will not pander to voters by telling you that I plan to go into that office and I will slash the, and slash the budget, because I, I won't do that. Um, and if that's the type of candidate you're looking for, uh, then you could vote for my opponent, because that's not what I would do. Um, I believe at this point, we're at, a, we're at a tipping point in Luzerne County's history with regard to dealing with crime. And what we have to do is use the resources that we have there more efficiently. I looked up crime statistics, uh, Pennsylvania State Police crime statistics, that you could all look up on the internet, and you will see uh, that our nine or 10 county detectives are averaging around uh, 10 arrests per month. That's one arrest per month per detective. Uh, that's unacceptable. Uh, we have to utilize the resources in that office much better. I will not promise you uh, that I will go in and I will reduce the budget. What I am telling you is that I will more effectively use the resources in that budget. Uh, I will redistribute the resources in that office, uh, but I will not uh, save money. Uh, Community-based prosecution is not cheap. Community-based pro prosecution is based on the premise of putting more money into programs now so you're not dealing with these people later. And so, if again, if you're looking at somebody who the $5 million budget that the district attorney's uh, office has out of about of $130 million of the county, if you're looking for a guy that's going to go in and reduce that, I'm not the guy. Okay, thank you. Ms. Salavantis? When I took office, one of the first things I did was reorganize the office. I promised that I would look at ways to make the office run more efficiently and effectively, and that's what I did. I used the specialized training of our assistant district attorneys and detectives and used it and made sure that we were using it appropriately. By doing that, as my opponent pointed out, I was able to save the county last year alone over a quarter of a million dollars. 
and we continue to fight every day and secure convictions on violent crime and drug offenses. And we still maintain a 100% criminal homicide conviction rate. If I could find a way to save money for the taxpayers, I will do that. I want to look at other ways to find additional resources that can come in and fund our office, help so we don't have to increase taxes every year. We need to find ways that we can combat the increase in crime, violent crime that's going on, but at the same time, being aware of the money that we're spending and knowing that this isn't money that is ours. This is the taxpayer's money. And I will make sure that I will look for ways that we can be more efficient in, in spending our money and making sure that we are still convicting the criminals that roam our street. Thank you. How can you most effectively reduce the crime rate in Wilkes-Barre and the surrounding areas? Unfortunately, there will always be bad people who commit bad crimes in our area. The increase in crime in our area has not occurred overnight. This has been an issue that has been building up. I've taken the steps to implement programs and initiatives that my predecessors failed to do. Some of these programs or initiatives that I brought into the district attorney's office was developing a gang intelligence unit to provide resources to our law enforcement who are fighting every day to keep their community safe. I secured a grant to obtain a criminal intelligence database so I can provide more information to our law enforcement that are fighting these issues every day and to protect their safety. We formed the ATAC unit the Advanced Tactical Anti-Crime Unit, so we can go into communities and help with the crime that is going on because our law enforcement doesn't have the resources. I purchased new investigative technology that reduces officer involvement in investigations. I've worked closely with federal and state law enforcement to see what, what help they can provide to our local police departments. I have a county detective that has joined the FBI Safe Streets Task Force so federal agents can come in and help us when we have violent crime occurring in our communities. We have done a lot in the past four years. Thank you. Mr. DeLuca? I would say, first of all, that conviction should not be the standard by which we measure the success or failure of our chief law enforcement officer in our county. Uh, that's the old way of determining success uh, for a DA. It's not the way, it's not a proactive way, it's not the way that the most urban areas uh, of uh, the United States have dealt with the crime problem. Uh, if you look at crime statistics for, for the island of Manhattan, and you look at uh, the seven major felonies, uh, back in the year 2000, they took this statistic, uh, 188,000 of those offenses were committed. In the year 2014, it was, that number was reduced by 42%. Now you tell me, who is the more successful DA or more successful prosecutor? Uh, the district attorney that secured convictions in 188,000 cases of the most serious felonies in the year 2000? Or the DA or DAs or prosecutors that came up with the plan to be able to reduce the number of crimes committed by over 42%? I'm telling you that community-based prosecution is the model that was followed in that county it's a model that was followed that was successful, uh, that reduced crimes of all types, not just violent crime, uh, but nonviolent crimes as well. It involves getting uh, DAs, uh, assistant DAs, detectives, and other resources, social services, into the communities, into the most high crime areas of the county, and, and being able to direct those resources in a proactive way. And it involves a number of, of different plans that I'll get to because we only have a minute and a half. This is, if we had two minutes, that <laughs> Oh, yeah, right, right, right. Then you'd want would two and a half. She could have two minutes, too, and I could have no, two minutes. No, How no. How could no. you talk about solving a, a crime problem in a minute and a half? What is your stance on alternate sentencing for drug cases? I am a, uh, a huge advocate of alternating, uh, alternate sentences for uh, drug cases. I could tell you that uh, I have very personal experiences with uh, drug court, uh, that, that where I've witnessed the success of drug court. 
part of my position on uh, the drug issue and part of the proactive approach to reducing crime uh, has to do with expansion of eligibility for drug court. Um, I know of, of two cases, one I could tell you specifically, uh, of an individual who, uh, who back when drug court started uh, was charged with the felony. Uh, in that case, uh, the Attorney General's office agreed to reduce the charge to, to the extent that that individual could get into drug court. Uh, that person right now uh, is in graduate school. That's the type of success that these programs have. That was 10 years ago. Those are the types of programs that should be uh, initiated and should be advocated. And I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, alternative programs, sentencing programs for nonviolent offenders. I could tell you right now, violent offenders, I will take as hard or harder stance on violent offenders, people who commit crime, uh, crimes with weapons, uh, than, than the likes of which we've seen over the term of this current d district attorney. But when it comes to nonviolent offenders, uh, I will advocate, I will be a, a huge advocate of expansion of drug court programs and other alternative sentencing programs. Thank you. Before I answer that, I do want to say something about um, the comment that my opponent made during the last question. Um, Can I, we wait and save that till the end? We're, otherwise, we're going to be going back and forth on course, that. Of course. That. Thank you. I'm, I'm very supportive of programs that work and make a difference for our community. 90% of the crime around here is fueled by drugs and addiction. There are some people who are violent in nature, and they belong behind bars, and we will prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. However, there are others who commit nonviolent offenses to fuel their addiction. I believe a sentencing alternative such as treatment court is warranted in these circumstances. Without the proper treatment, they will be released from jail and continue to victimize our communities. We need to find ways to help these smaller offense, drug possession offenses and criminals. Luzerne County's treatment court, although my opponent stated that we only limit a treatment court to certain crimes, we do that because of the funding source we have, because we are only permitted to allow in nonviolent offenders. But treatment court is successful. We have permitted into the program as many people as we possibly can to help them. They are motivated by their addiction. Our program has the best success rate throughout the, the state. With the first year recidivism rate, 88% success rate. The second year and third year, 93% to 95%. Thank you. Your time's up. Thank you. The next question will be for you. Assuming no budget increases for the DA's office, what can you do to make the prosecution process more efficient and effective? Well, I, I know I've discussed it before, but when I came in, to the office, we took a drastic cut in our budget. I reorganized the office and made it more efficient and effective by using the experience and the training that our assistant district attorneys have and our detectives. We were able to convict, continue to convict and uh, on these violent crime and drug offenses and still, con and still hold a 100% homicide conviction rate. If, as we go forward, I would also look to, as we take over the drug task force, use the money that we will be obtaining through the forfeitures to help fund the office and purchase technology that will help us in investigating crimes and prosecuting these criminals to the fullest extent of the law. Thank you. Mr. DeLuca? Well, I mean, first of all, uh I know the advertisements, I don't remember whether she said it here tonight, but uh, uh, Attorney Salavanis has said over and over again how she saved $250,000 uh, for the taxpayers over the past number of years, or maybe it was in one year, I, I don't remember, uh, I, won't, I won't hold her to, to either one, but uh, that $250,000 could have been used to put more people into specialty court. That $250,000 could have been used to solve one of the 13 unsolved hom homicides that are out there still uh, just during the term of, of, of her administration. 
that $250,000 could have been used to stop our cities from, turn, to, uh, from turning into war zones. That $250,000 could have been used for getting resources out into the community to prevent crime. Uh, and so you can't have it both ways. You can't come out and say, uh, we need more resources, we need to be able to, uh, to go out and, and get more ability to be able to prosecute these crimes, and then go and, and, uh, and boast that you're saving $250,000. I'm telling you right now, uh, if I was in that office and I found through uh, recognizing inefficiencies that I was able to save $250,000 on different bu uh, budget line items, I would re uh, inject that money into the programs I believe in, the proactive uh, uh, programs that I believe in, uh, in order to effectively reduce crime. We are at a critical stage in Luzerne County uh, for crime, and it's going to take more than, than what we're doing now. Thank you. There's a serious pl problem with sexual assault rape of high school students. What will you do to ensure justice to the victims? Um, well, uh, ca uh, cases of violence, as I said, uh, certainly number one priority for uh, my administration uh, would be uh, arrest, prosecution, incarceration of violent offenders. That would include people who commit the crime of, of rape. Um, I believe if you look at, again, the community-based prosecution model, you're looking at getting into schools with assistant DAs, getting into schools with detectives, with support staff, and educating kids on many aspects of crime, uh, including date rape, sexual assault, uh, sexting, uh, theft, drugs, you name it. So other than the fact that, that uh, I would treat certainly a, a violent offense uh, of a sexual nature in the same way I would, I would treat uh, a, a violent offense with a weapon, um, there's no specific other specific uh, way that I would address that. Thank you. Ms. Salavantis? Over the past four years, we have put a lot of our energy into making sure that we are out there educating students and educating, educating our community on coming forward if there are any issues that they feel that need to be addressed. We are in the school districts. Our, I have a detective who specifically is assigned to go into the school district and work, work closely with our schools and make sure that they know that we are there for them. We have, and as I stated before, when I organize the office into specialized units, we have a division of attorneys who specifically handle those cases. These are sensitive cases. When you're, when you're working closely with victims of sexual crimes and rape, these are cases that you want to make sure you have the, the best, the most educated, the most trained individuals working on because you, not only in this position, are there to fight to keep the bad guys behind bars, you are there to fight for the victims. And you have to be an advocate for the victims. And that's what our, our, our office does. And when Mr. DeLuca talks about community policing and having our attorneys work in, and work in specific areas, they need to know a little bit about everything. Well, I think it's important to know a lot about a lot of, to know a lot about specific things like our sexual, uh, our sexual violence unit does. Thank you. The newspapers have reported a number of instances where people have stolen money from fire stations, sports teams, etc. What would you do as a district attorney to mitigate these thefts? I have already begun the process of putting together a, a, a team that will go out and educate our community programs our nonprofits. We need to have more checks and balances. We are spending a lot of our resources investigating these crimes. I have a detective that is specifically assigned to white collar cases. One case alone, a, the person hasn't even been charged. One case alone, he has been working for three months straight on. These 
are cases that are difficult and they are time consuming and take a lot of resources from our office. We need to be more proactive. That is why I put this team together to go out and talk to the community and, and inform them of what they need to know when a nonprofit is formed what they should do to make sure that their treasurer is handling the situation appropriately. Having people that are not a husband and wife that are running the organization. We need checks and balances, and I think that's the way that we can combat these issues. Thank you. Mr. DeLuca? Well, first of all, I would say I, I, I think if my opponent was more, being, was more proactive on being proactive, uh, we would already have these things in place. Uh, the fact is, uh, I believe just recently in July of 2015, uh, a press release was issued from the district attorney, as it often is, about some new program uh, where uh, she believed that it was a good idea to deny ARDs uh, for first-time offenders for people who steal from community organizations. And that sounds great. And that gets those people who are angry about someone who has a gambling problem or a drinking or a drug problem uh, people who are angry at them from stealing from their fire department or stealing from their school organization. Uh, but then, uh, just a matter of a few weeks ago, uh, a Times Leader article, October 15, 2015, I see that they approved what's called a Rule 586 for a lawyer who stole from a community organization. So, if you have a policy, if you have a philosophy on how to deal with the problem, then deal with it in that way consistently. We're talking about equal justice for all. We're not talking about making exceptions in one case uh, or another. Uh, I could tell you with regard to investigation uh, of crimes, uh, I don't know where this detective is spending three months on one case uh, for uh, investigating these organizations. I represent two municipal entities where I've turned over investigations to the DA's office and I was told you must go out hire an auditor on your own, and turn the audit over to us. So whatever detective is doing that work, she doesn't realize it, but he's not doing auditing, and that's the lion's share of the work to prosecute these crimes. Thank you. What will you do to get help for re repeat offend offenders so they stop the cycle of committing crimes? Well, again, I believe in, in uh, alternative programs, not only for uh, regular first-time nonviolent offenders, but I agree uh, with uh, programs, uh, alternative programs for uh, repeat nonviolent offenders. Because our job is, our goal is, to keep that nonviolent offender from becoming violent. And I believe uh, that some people require a few more than one or two chances before, uh, before they, they finally get on the straight path. Again, if you, if you go back to the statistic I mentioned earlier. Think of how huge that is. Think of how significant it is that you go for, uh, that Manhattan with the seven major felonies reduced their crime from 188,000, reduced it to just over 100,000 uh, in 14 years. Imagine the significance of that. That's 42% less victims. That's 42% less property loss. Proactive prosecution is the only way to address uh, the problems that we're having now. What we've done, what we are doing, absolutely does not work. Thank you. Ms. Salavantis. My opponent keeps bringing up Manhattan. What he fails to tell you is that their budget is significantly higher than ours. Their law enforcement has many more resources than we do. We are very different. Luzerne County is very different than Manhattan. We are doing our best to make sure that we are keeping the bad guys off our streets, unlike my opponent, as he said earlier, who works to make sure that he reduces sentences for the criminals and, and allows them to re-victimize our community. We have programs that help. We are, are very active with treatment court, as we discussed earlier, for nonviolent offenders who are motivated by addiction. Like I said, 90% of the crime that is occurring is centered around drugs 
and addiction. We are trying to make sure that we are keeping our streets safe, and we will continue to do that. Thank you. Do you favor decriminalization of marijuana? That is a very interesting question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we aim to be interesting here. <laughs> There are pros and cons to decriminalizing marijuana. I believe that it is important to allow people who are suffering medically to be able to have some type of, um, some type of, of um, medication, such as marijuana, that eases their pain. I agree with that. However, I don't completely agree with decriminalizing marijuana. We are doing a lot of, excuse me, a lot of the violent crime that we are seeing occurring in our communities. You would think that it is a, typically about heroin, cocaine, crack, different crimes like that, different drugs like that. However, what we're seeing is that it mainly is based around marijuana, large quantities of marijuana. And if we decriminalize marijuana, we will still have those issues that will not go away. I do believe that we need to look at different ways to help assist people who have small possessions, which we have. We started allowing them through the ARD process. And I see that the stop sign has come up and I have to stop. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have no position on that. I don't, I'll be honest with you, I'm not, I'm not running for an office of a legislator. I could tell you that uh, I will uphold the law in, in whatever, however the legislature determines uh, uh, that, that that should turn out. Uh, and I would like to save my rest of my time for one of these other questions. <laughs> no, 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 we're not. Doing that. This is not. Uh, this that, question is. This not is what we agreed. To the we agreed to this. The you attorney both and, agreed to this format, okay? And, and well, thank you for uh, uh, honoring your uh, commitment. That, that's all. Uh, what is your view on the growing problem of thre thre theft from and abuse of the elderly? Well, uh, as far as. Uh, whether or not it's it's a growing problem or not a growing problem, I, I think one of the uh, one of the issues related to uh, theft and, and crimes against the elderly, so much of it still has to do with uh, alcohol and drug abuse of those who are abusing them. Uh, I think it also has to do with uh, gambling. Uh, the the experiences that I've had or I've seen uh, uh, seem to point to those issues. Um, again, the proactive approach to crime has to do with, and, and one of the things that I would look to do is to create uh, an elder unit within the district attorney's office and also try to organize an elder task force. Um, some counties across the United States have what's called an elder task force. The elder task force includes not only members of law enforcement, but also members of Department of Aging, other social services, uh, as well as, believe it or not, financial institutions uh, and other uh, vendors, organizations that get together uh, and try to come up ways to make sure that you protect, uh, protect the elderly and protect their, their, uh, their property uh, and protect their safety as well. Um, the elder unit within the DA's office would include, uh, would include uh, ADAs as well as detectives. Uh, much of it would have to do with, uh, with speaking to uh, elder areas where uh, high rises and, and other areas where, uh, where the elderly are and try to educate them more on, on issues uh, that, that are certainly important to them. So. Thank you. Ms. Salavantes. When I took office, I did form an elder abuse unit. It is made up of an assistant district attorney as well as a detective. That detective is trained and educated on elder abuse, financial exploitation, physical abuse, anything involving our elderly in our community. They have been through trainings and assist law enforcement with this specialized training. We are 
and we do have an elder abuse task force here in Luzerne County, which I am an active member of. We have monthly meetings to discuss the elder abuse cases within our office and throughout Luzerne County. And we do work closely with Area Agency on Aging and how we can assist our elderly, our senior citizens here in Luzerne County. With the Elder Abuse Task Force, we have together conducted seminars throughout Luzerne County, informing people about elder abuse, telling them what they need to be aware of, making sure that they're looking out for their elderly neighbor or their mother or their sister, making sure that they're educated on what they should know or what signs that they should be what signs that they should be looking for. We are very active when it comes to elder abuse in Luzerne County because we have one of the largest elderly <coughs> populations in the state. Thank you. It seems we are hearing more and more about school shootings or threats of guns in schools. What can the DA do to make, DA do to make parents and children safer in our schools? I have worked closely with the school districts from the day I took office, making them aware that we are here for them with whatever issues that they need to discuss. These are unfortunate circumstances. We are seeing more of these shootings taking place throughout our nation. I have conducted an active shooter training for law enforcement to be prepared if something does occur and we are taking that training and we're going throughout our school districts so that when law enforcement, and hopefully it will never have to come to this in Luzerne County, but if it does, our law enforcement will be prepared. So the number of victims in these situations is greatly reduced. I want the school districts to know that the district attorney's office is always here for them. And if there are ever issues that they need to discuss, we will be there. I have also been a part of safe schools presentations throughout the school districts. We were just at one a couple weeks ago in the Hanover Area School District. It's important that our kids see us and know that they can come talk to us. If they do not feel comfortable, they see something going on in their school, that they have someone that they can go to. And that is what their school resource officer is. And we are there to help them and to listen to them if they ever need it. Thank you. Mr. DeLuca? I represent uh, two school districts in Luzerne County. I've represented a number of other school districts as well. Um, and, uh, you know, violence in schools uh, and, uh, and crime in schools uh, is a problem. Uh, I could tell you that uh, one, of the, uh, one of the approaches that we're taking now in one of the school districts that I represent uh, is a pilot truancy program to keep the kids in school because when the kids are out of school, uh, they're getting into trouble. And uh, when they're forced to come back to school, in many cases, they bring that trouble back to the school. So what we're doing in, in, uh, in Nanticoke School District, which is a school which is where I went to school, uh, we had a truancy, a very serious truancy issue. Uh, we started a pilot program that's very similar to the same community-based prosecution model that, that I'm proposing. Uh, we brought in, instead of just taking parents to the magistrate and, uh, and citing a parent for not uh, having their kid in school, uh, we actually bring the parents in with the student uh, with social services, with uh, representatives of children and youth, and, uh, and also law enforcement, sit down with the school officials. We identify whether or not there are special needs that the, the child has, whether or not the child needs an edu uh, individualized education plan, what are the problems uh, that are stopping that child from coming to school. And in most cases, when these kids are in, in grade school, uh, they're not coming to school, not because they don't want to be in school, uh, but because their parents don't have the ability to get them there. And so we arrange bridge services through social services to get, help get them there. Uh, and I believe that education and getting them in school is the way to stop many of the problems. Thank you. Um, 
Because of overcrowding in prison, some people are advocating for reduced or no jail time for minor drug offenses. What's your position on that? My position on that? Your position on that. Uh, Whatever the legislature decides, uh, you know, again, I, I believe that the role of the district attorney is to comply with what the, what the law provides. I, I'm not going to advocate greater or lesser sentences for certain types of crime, uh, but what I will do is determine whether or not certain types of crime uh, deserve uh, the, the opportunity uh, to go through alternative sentencing programs, which are also programs that are provided for uh, by the Pennsylvania Code. So. Nonviolent drug offenses, uh, nonviolent drug offenses, again, I think you all know my position. I believe that, that in any way possible, uh, we should make efforts to keep those nonviolent offenders from becoming violent. Uh, there's a statistic out there that shows that 90% of all uh, offenders who are sentenced to jail are released within three years of their incarceration. They come out angrier, they come out more despondent because they can't get a job, and they come out more schooled in the ways of crime. Uh, we call it crime college. So if there's a way to keep those nonviolent offenders from going to crime college and coming out uh, being more likely to commit a crime, uh, then we should take those, uh, those methods. And so I do believe in alternative sentencing programs uh, for nonviolent offenders. As far as whether or not I would go to the state legislature and argue for reduced sentences, that would not be my job as the DA, and I would not do that. Thank you. Ms. Salvantis? I believe this is the only time, Mr. Duluc, and I would agree upon something. Um, I agree that nonviolent offenders for small possession cases should be allowed into alternate programs, like treatment court. As I stated before, I believe it works. We have a success rate, a great success rate. If they, within the first year of completing treatment court, they will be 83% successful, meaning that they will never, 83% of the people going through that, that program will never reoffend. I think that is very important. We need to provide incentive for these nonviolent offenders to not reoffend, to not turn to drugs, not turn to their addiction if they could. And that's what treatment court is. And I believe in that program. Thank you. Gangs are diversifying into other crimes such as identity theft. Has the county experienced this situation and what should be done to reduce these? the situation? When I took office, one of the big areas that I focused on, primary areas that I focused on when I started going through cases and learning more about the violent crime that's being committed within our neighborhoods, I realized that gangs was the common theme. What I did was start a gang unit within our office and we teamed up with the Hazelton Gang Task Force. And we brought law enforcement to the table and we discussed all of the problems that we were facing in Luzerne County because, because of the gang issues. A lot of people wanted to turn their back and say, we don't have gang problems here. No, we don't. You don't say that. Don't say gang in Luzerne County. What happens a week later? A kid's arm almost gets cut off by a machete. That was gang involvement. We can't turn our back on these issues anymore. And people are starting to realize that gang, with gangs comes violent crime, comes identity theft, comes um, homicides, drug offenses. They are taking over our communities and we need to do more about it. And that is why I started the Gang Intelligence Unit. That's why our office works closely with the FBI and the, the state police. We need to work as a team and we need to do more to combat these issues within our community. Thank you. Mr. DeLuca? I, I don't know what the gang, uh, the gang uh, crime unit has been doing for the past four years, but uh, what we see in our streets a, on a daily basis uh, uh, seems to be gang violence to me. Uh, it seems like uh, almost every day when you wake up and open the newspaper, 
uh, you're seeing shootings, uh, you're seeing stabbings. Um, is she saying that it would be worse if we didn't have this gang unit? I have no idea. Uh, I did see, I believe, uh, a press release that, that she issued indicating she was forming the gang unit. Uh, I haven't seen what it's done. Uh, what I do know is what the numbers show, what the Pennsylvania uh, crime statistics show for what our detectives are doing uh, on an annual basis as far as arrests go. I could tell you that. So if there are uh, detectives on that crime unit, they're not making arrests. Uh, if there's intelligence that they're provided, certainly I wouldn't be privy to that. Um, but we do have a gang problem. I don't believe that four years ago we had a gang problem like we have now. I know she's saying that it was always here and we refuse to acknowledge it. I can't speak for her predecessor, but I could say that it seems like it got a lot worse over the last four years. So whatever they're doing isn't working. Thank you. What is your position on the crime of cruelty to animals and what priority have you or will you assign to your, to your administration? Well, cr cruel, is that for me? That was for you, yes. Uh, cruelty to animals uh, certainly are uh, type of cases that need to be prosecuted and, uh, and for a number of reasons. Number one, cruelty to animals is a crime. Uh, it's been a crime for hundreds of years. Uh, the FBI just placed that crime on one of their most serious crimes lists, uh, the, cruel, the, the uh, crime of cruelty to animals. Uh, I think another part or another aspect of the crime of cruelty to animals is, believe it or not, uh, the fact that it could be a predictor or an indicator of human crime. Many times when you discover homes that have uh, the crime of, of, uh, of cruelty to animals, you find that other crimes against human beings have been committed or being committed. Because someone who commits terrible acts against animals uh, also, in many cases, commits terrible acts against children, terrible acts against the elderly, terrible acts against their spouse. Uh, I believe also that cruelty to animals could be a predictor of future crime. So when you find an individual who commits uh, those types of acts against animals, in many cases, that individual will also uh, be someone who, unless there's some sort of intervention, uh, will commit crimes on, uh, on people in the future. So as part of the community-based prosecution model, I believe that, uh, that that is also another aspect, another prong uh, that has to be dealt with. And when you find those cases, uh, those cruelty to animal cases, they are indicators that there are other issues uh, that have to be dealt with. Thank you. Ms. Salavantis? I believe we should prosecute those who abuse our animals to the fullest extent of the law. The law that the legislators have put in place. In my opinion, it's not harsh enough. And I have spoken to uh, Senator Baker and Representative Bobeck about what we can do to increase the penalties for those who do commit crimes against our animals. This is an issue that has been taking place and we have been working closely with the SPCA in trying to figure out different alternatives, what we can do to have more eyes on the streets. Being able to find out, as, as Mr. DeLuca stated, that we do believe that this could, from animal abuse, it could lead into abuse to humans adults, children, you name it. We need to be able to prosecute these individuals to the fullest extent of the law and make sure we know when it is occurring. We've had instances where people come to us after the fact and say, well, this was happening, and the animal is no longer there. We can't do much. We need people to come forward when they know that animal abuse is occurring so we can we can immediately respond. Thank you. This is kind of a long question, so bear with me. One plan put forth in this election to reduce crime involves forfeiting drug houses in high crime areas, reno renovating them and moving police officers and their families into them for free or very little rent. Do you think this plan would work in Luzerne County? 
And if so, as the chief law enforcement officer, are you willing to be the first to move yourself and your family into one of these houses? First of all, no. I have seen these homes and I would not put my worst enemy in those homes. I don't believe that is a good approach. If you have been paying attention to the change, the changes that have been taking place, there are people that are trying to limit our ability on taking property from individuals who commit crime. The issue revolved around taking homes off of people who have committed crimes, specifically in Philadelphia. That was not something that the legislators had in mind when they put together the Forfeiture Act. I believe that we can use the money that comes in from drug forfeitures that are being used for criminal enterprises, use that money to put it back on the streets, give it to law enforcement so they can fight this crime we are seeing every day on our streets. They don't have the resources, like Manhattan may have or San Francisco. We don't have the resources. Our, municipal, our municipalities don't have the resources to put into their law enforcement. And by taking over the drug task force, one of my initiatives, we would be able to obtain 100% of the forfeitures that come through our office. And my goal is to make sure that we can put those resources into what is important, our law enforcement. Thank you. Mr. DeLuca. First of all, I, you said you didn't have the resources to do this, but uh, you also boasted saving $250,000 uh, and reducing, somehow reducing your budget. Um, regarding the plan to, that, that was referred to in the question that was presented, uh, that was actually from a book by Kamala Harris, uh, who was uh, a DA in San Francisco. The book is called Smart on Crime. And what it is is uh, that was one of the proactive methods used by the uh, district attorney for the city of Atlanta. Uh, and uh, what he did was he forfeited a, a property in a high crime area. Uh, he used civil forfeiture funds to rehab the property. And then he offered the property to police officers for little or no rent. They actually did move in. They actually, this is, I don't know what, uh, Attorney Salvana said she had seen these homes. I have no idea what homes she's, she's seen because we haven't done this in Luzerne County. We haven't done this, uh, as far as I know, in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's just one idea though. It's way of thinking outside the box. It's not about being tough on crime. It's about being smart on crime. And again, uh, as far as the, the meat on the bones and the nuts and bolts when it comes to, uh, to that specific plan, uh, that's just one of the innovative ideas with regard to civil forfeiture. I could tell you this as well. I don't know how familiar this current administration actually is with civil forfeiture because after this current administration took office, the number of civil forfeiture actions trailed off significantly. Thank you. How do you plan to address the rise in crime by non-residents, uh, occupants who come into our area? Non-residents? I, I guess people that aren't from, people that come in from out of town, I guess is the way I read it. Um, I could tell, as far as commit, uh, people who commit crimes from out of the area, uh, if you're talking about people who are from out of the area and move in to Luzerne County, I, I, what I would do, uh, and I've been an advocate of this from the beginning, and that is to use the Civil Forfeiture Act to, uh, to take properties of landlords who rent to criminals uh, where they know there's criminal activity occurring. Uh, I think by filing uh, lawsuits against these landlords under the Civil Forfeiture Act uh, to take their properties, they may screen people uh, just a little bit better under threat of losing their property. So if that's what you're talking about, uh, we certainly can't shut down, build a big fence around Luzerne County and shut, out, uh, shut people out from, uh, from driving through and committing crimes. But what we can do is make an effort through the Civil Forfeiture Act by threatening to and actually taking uh, properties from landlords who rent to criminals. Uh, we could take away their ability to set up shop here in Luzerne County. Thank you. Ms. Salavantis. 
Unfortunately, we can't stop people from coming into our county. I know that that is a question I'm asked all the time. How do we stop the inflow of people from New York, from Philadelphia, from New Jersey that are committing crimes in our neighborhoods? We can't stop that. As Mr. DeLuca said, we can't put a fence around our county and say, sorry, you're not welcome. What we can do is deter people, deter them from coming here, saying that we are tough on crime. And if you commit a crime in our neighborhood, you will pay the price. That is why I have started the process of taking over the drug task force. I think it's important to show that or use the resources of the drug task force, the resources that we would obtain from the state funds that would come in and put them into our local municipalities and give them the resources that they do not have right now to fight the crime on the street. We need to do more to investigate and prosecute these individuals who are committing these violent crimes on our streets. We also need to be proactive. And by doing that, I believe we need to start educating kids in our schools. Talk to the children and tell them that it isn't smart to look to your friend and use drugs because you don't know what tomorrow will bring when you're using that drug. Talk to someone who has been addicted. Thank you. That's all the time we're going to have for our questions. Now we're going to get, let each of the candidates sum up and, and close up. And we will, uh, I think we can increase the time to two and a half minutes. Oh. How's that? Okay, well. <laughs> Say thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, you get to go first, first, please. Yes. But I went first. Yes. Uh, and then so I go first for the closing. closing that's well. correct. Yep. Okay. That's correct. Uh, First of all, because of the, the time constraints, I could, uh, I'm a little bit upset that we haven't talked about some other important issues. For example, domestic violence. Um, domestic violence in Luzerne County is a huge problem. Domestic violence in Luzerne County has been a huge problem uh, for decades. Uh, Luzerne, uh, domestic violence hasn't been dealt with appropriately uh, in Luzerne County for decades. And what we've seen in Luzerne County with regard to domestic violence is a flip-flopping of strategies going back and forth between, uh, number one, uh, administrations from a number of years ago forcing victims to testify uh, against the perpetrator of domestic violence and uh, thereby re-victimizing the victim. Uh, what we've seen in the current administration is the exact opposite approach because the other one didn't work. Candidly, it didn't. Uh, what we've seen now uh, is going back to the other approach. And the other approach is to empower the victim and to allow the victim to choose whether or not uh, to prosecute the case of domestic violence by not showing up or by notifying law enforcement uh, that he or she does not wish to pursue uh, the domestic violence case anymore. The problem with this is that does not solve the problem. Uh, domestic violence victims are most likely to have offenses committed against them again, uh, more so than any other crime. What we have to look at is the difference between keeping a victim safe and keeping a victim secure. And that's one of the, the problems. Our law protects victims of domestic violence by giving them immediate safety, by removing the offender from, their, uh, from the property or from, uh, from their presence in order to keep them uh, safe but it doesn't make them secure. Uh, I would propose starting a domestic violence unit that would actually involve uh, members of the DA's office, uh, the county detectives, local law enforcement who investigate these crimes, as well as workforce development, uh, children and youth, Department of Aging and Appropriate Circumstances, and mental health. And to go into uh, these uh, places and be able to deal with the domestic violence issue uh, from the beginning. And I'm, I could see now, I was given two and a half minutes, and I'm already almost out of time. So all I'm going to say is this. Uh, if you don't like what I said, please vote for my opponent. Do me and my family a favor. Because four years from now, when I would come back and ask you for your vote, I only want to be held to what I said I would do, and that's it. I'm going to tell you what I will do, and I will do as I say. So if you don't like it, I would ask you to vote for my opponent. And that's it. I'm sorry. Thank I you. I had more time. Thank you. Ms. Salavantis. Please hold your applause. We'll have an opportunity to thank more can both candidates in a minute. Thank you.
Ms. Salavantis. With the issue of domestic violence that my opponent has been discussing, we do have a domestic violence task force here in Luzerne County. We work closely with community organizations, law enforcement, our office, in making sure that we proceed on every case. We do not empower the victim to not come forward and not proceed with the case. We do just the opposite because we care about the victims. We do not want to see that woman that we were just working with who wants to not testify against her boyfriend. We don't want to see that woman dead the next day. So we make sure that we, we proceed as much as we can on these cases. They're difficult case if, cases if the victims don't want to proceed, but we have trained law enforcement on what to do in order to cover our case when the victim doesn't want to cooperate. They take the necessary reports and we can put them on to testify so we can protect that victim. In closing, I think that we have witnessed tonight and throughout the campaign, this campaign, that there are some major differences between my opponent and I. While he uses words like promises and experiences as punchlines, like most politicians do, I do not. I take this job very seriously, and I am very proud to have served as your district attorney for the past four years. Four years ago, I stood before you and vowed that I would restore trust and integrity into the district attorney's office. And I would make sure that it was run efficiently and effectively. And tonight I am proud to sit before you and tell you that we have done just that. I have specialized the office to better protect our children and our seniors so they do not become victims of crime. I created a gang intelligence unit that gives law enforcement the tools that they need to combat gangs, drugs, and violent crime. I am extremely proud of the work that we have done for victims and their families. And a large part of our job is not just to lock up the criminals, it's to be a compassionate advocate for victims. Leadership is more than making misleading statements and criticisms. Leadership is about fulfilling promises, setting direction, making decisions, and getting results. Thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf... I'd, I'd, I'd like to thank you all for coming out this evening. I'd also like to thank Wyoming Seminary and President Ray and Mr. Kubasik for setting this up for us. Um, please look for our voter's guide, which will appear in the paper uh, the day before the election. And don't forget to vote on November 3rd. Thank you very much. And I especially want to thank the candidates. Thank you. Thank you.